welcome to this uh, exciting event. It's part of the McGillicuddy Humanities Center uh, Academic Year Symposium on the Legacies of World War I. I'm Margot Lukens. I'm the director of the McGillicuddy Humanities Center. And um, we sponsor this and other uh, humanities events both on and off campus. The mission of the center is to advance the humanities uh, on the campus and to connect with other humanities institutions of the state to share the resources in the humanities from the University of Maine and particularly to connect them with students and teachers of uh, Maine's K-12 schools. So um, we're very glad that everyone's here today and um, I just wanted to draw your attention to an upcoming event, Bangor Humanities Day. If you're seeing this poster around, um, the events take place next weekend, March 1st and 2nd. We start with a party on Friday night at the Humane Museum of Art in Bangor. And then we have all day events in, um, on Saturday at the Bangor Public Library, at the museum, and finally at Nocturnum Draft House. We'll have a poetry reading. So um, come to our website for more information on this event. So I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Zachary Ludington, uh, who's been very instrumental in creating this symposium, and uh, he'll introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, I'm Zach Ludington. I'm from the Department of Modern Languages and Classics, and I've been working with Margot and with Amy, uh, new to the McGillicuddy Humanities Center, helping us uh, to develop this programming and put it into uh, motion, and it's been really wonderful this year, so this is one event of many. Look out for more to come. Uh, now we're really happy to welcome Jahan Ramazani from the University of Virginia. There he is University Professor and Edgar F. Shannon Professor of English. Um, he uh, he uh, works at UVA and has for a long time. It's also his alma mater. Of course, after doing his bachelor's degree there, he went elsewhere. He earned graduate degrees at Oxford and at Yale. His first book after finishing the PhD at Yale was on Yeats and the poetry of death. Since then, he has been a ceaselessly curious and clear-eyed, I'd say ceaselessly clear-eyed. He writes very clearly and very accessibly, um, and it's a pleasure to read him, so ceaselessly, I'd say. <laughs> clear-eyed, critic of global poetry in English. Um, he's published many books and articles and racked up many awards. Today, we welcome him to our conversation on the legacies of the First World War in poetry across the globe in various languages. So our panelists will help us to consider what the arguments um, from John, Jahan's um, article can, can do for us as we think in other languages and other cultures. Um, the article that we'll be discussing is titled Cosmopolitan Sympathies, Poetry of the First Global War. Um, and we're going to see um, how cosmopolitan we can get and where we can take it. We uh, are, myself, Carlos Villacorta, my colleague from Modern Languages and Classics, Michael Lang from History, and Carla Villateri from English. They're all sitting in the front row because we're going to turn it over to Jahan and let him use this space. Um, so we're going to get out of the way for a minute and he's going to kick us off. From there, we'll all have some things to say about how his work and his ideas intersect with our own. And then hopefully the conversation will grow from there, be organic, and allow for your guys' participation as well. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to Margot and Amy in the McGillicuddy Humanities Center for organizing. Thank you to Jahan for being very flexible and figuring out a way to get here uh, <laughs> between two different snowstorms. Um, uh, so thanks a lot. We're, we're very happy. Uh, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, had a had wonderful conversations. Uh, since I've been here. Zach's been incredibly gracious, generous, energetic. Those of you who know him, you've already seen uh, what an energetic uh, host you can, you can imagine. Uh, I'm wearing his boots, for example, so we can go to Gideon uh, Park uh, today, this morning, uh, and s try to slip up a mountain, which was uh, kind of a little tricky. Uh, but uh, we made a little way up. Uh, also, I'd like to thank, of course, Margot and the McGillicuddy Humanities Center She's also been very gracious in, um, uh, toward, uh, to me, and I appreciate uh, you know, the wonderful series uh, that you've put together um, with Zach for this year and being part of it as we all try to reflect on the legacies of the First World War. Um, 
and of course, I'm thankful, to, grateful to my fellow panelists uh, who will be speaking to us and sharing their wisdom. Um, I felt right at home here ever since I arrived uh, a few days ago. There's a large stuffed bear in the hotel <laughs> lobby where I've been. Uh, Maine having, I understand, the largest black bear population of any state in the country. And it's kind of like my backyard where I took this uh, picture of this floor. We have a wonderful bear family. So I was thinking, Aww. if you find when the bears come out of hibernation that you're missing a few, I'd like to invite all of you to come visit in Virginia and take a bear or two back with you uh, to Maine where they'll fit right in. In any event, um, the uh, essay that some of you read on First World War poetry, uh, I'll just say a, a few things uh, by way of leading into a dis uh, discussion um, uh, uh, about ideas that intersect with it. It's part of a larger kind of book length um, manuscript on poetry in a global age. Um, there are so many wonderful poets and poetry scholars at this university very distinguished legacy of that scholarship. So I'll just, I, you know, it's great to have an opportunity to try out a couple of these ideas. Um, the, the larger book try, tries to expand the argument of an uh, earlier book of mine called Transnational Poetics, which argues against what's been called kind of um, methodological nationalism, uh, particularly in poetry studies. Um, and uh, although we tend to think, um, you know, of our cars and our airplanes, in terms of all the different parts uh, coming from different places, uh, Japan, uh, Africa, and so forth, um, and, and uh, migrating together. Uh, we don't tend to think of poems that way. Um, you know, we tend to put the made in the USA label, or made in England, made in Jamaica, and so forth on them. And I think we shouldn't uh, understand poems primarily as the product of one nation or another, but as a formal and discursive intertwining of intersecting histories, geographies, cultures, a machine made of words, as Williams called a poem. Uh, but like a car or airplane, it's parts from many different places and times. Even a nationalist machine by Williams or another poet, after all, is made of words, techniques, and ideas, of rhythms, images, and stanzas that bear a, mul mul a, a multinational and heterogeneous array of traces. Um, in a discussion of the skills and knowledge, the natural and human-made ingredients, that go into the composition of a hammer. Bruno Latour uh, helps us, I think, to um, think about the kind of polytemporal and polyspatial uh, dimension of, um, in my case, uh, poetics. Um, so I'm really trying to kind of build off, uh, build on, um, build on his thinking in that regard. Um, because poems, I think, enfold very temporalities and spaces and the radially vector language, techniques, forms, and rhetorical strategies um, uh, that they embody. So in the various chapters of this book, after this first chapter, which I've been trying to heavily revise and re rethink, um, uh, I um, explore uh, modern contemporary poetry with the help of various lenses. Um, I look again at uh, the Orientalist paradigm through Yeats, thinking about his intersections with Byzantium back to um, ancient Persia and elsewhere. Um, Eco-criticism, eco um, thinking with the help of people like um, uh, Tim Morton about the ecological thought, um, uh, about Wallace Stevens, from poets from Wallace Stevens to Juliana Spar, about the kind of interconnectedness uh, of um, human and natural life on our planet, and the very concept of globality. Uh, Postcolonial studies, I'll just mention microformalism, cultural geography, writing about poets like Olson and Niedeker, tourism studies, Ashbury, linguistics, uh, poets from Pound to um, uh, Craig Santos Perez, and issues of code switching, and translation studies. Pound's been very important. This is being the great home of Pound studies. Um, <laughs> and I think you know, uh, provides us, I think, great guidance for thinking about translation in relation to the debates recently about world literature. So um, I'll say uh, um, I, I'll leave all of that suspended, but I, I want to. Um, 
you know, this first chapter that you've looked at, a uh, kind of test drive version of, tries to uh, look at how various wartime poets seized on and developed the cosmopolitan potentialities of poetry. And in keeping with your series focus, I thought I'd try to get us started by adding a few thoughts to that piece. Despite the unprecedented scale of human slaughter in the First World War, many of us continue to look uh, a century later for signs of something beyond the death drive, uh, to turn uh, Freud, of course, on his head, beyond sheer murderous aggression that Freud saw in it, beyond the nationalist and imperialist warmongering that proved so catastrophic. And I think it's a little wonder, then, that the Christmas truce of 1914, spontaneous outbreaks of fraternization along parts of the Western Front, has been playing such an outsized role in the popular imagination. Um, in 2014, when the Imperial War Museum in London uh, had been recently renovated, I, I rushed there to, to see it uh, on the way to give a talk about post-war war. Um, and it, it was interesting, fascinating to see there a whole section uh, devoted to pictures and memor memorabilia from this episode, including this one with German and British troops together. Recently, the British poet <coughs> laureate, Carol Ann Duffy, uh, some of you might know her from her wonderful collection, The World's Wife, which um, looks at uh, various uh, old stories like from the uh, kind of feminist perspective, Mrs. Darwin, Mrs. Lazarus, and so forth. It's really a wonderful humorous series of dramatic monologues. She recounts in a poem called The Christmas Truce, Truce, published both in The Guardian and a short illustrated um, book, the following. She says, men who would drown in mud, be gassed or shot or vaporized by falling shells, or live to tell, heard for the first time then, Stille Nacht, I won't try to say it, <laughs> Heilige Nacht, alles schläft einsam war. Karya, uh, darling, or love from love, Karya in Welsh, the song was a sudden bridge from man to man, a gift to the heart from home or childhood, someplace shared. When it was done, the British soldiers cheered. Incorporating song, the poem reflects on itself in the mirror of a sister genre. Like a poem, a song can be, as she says, a bridge from person to person across cultural and political differences. For each singer, it's effectively rooted, of course, in local or childhood experience, but can extend across time and space. In Duffy's account, songs, song forms that are often mobilized to fortify dividing lines between warring sides can paradoxically also unite so-called enemies. As she goes on, the Scotsman started to bawl the first Noel and all joined in till the Germans stood, seeing across the divide the sprawled mute shapes of those who had died. All night along the Western Front they sang the enemies, carols, hymns, folk songs, anthems, and Germans, English, German, English, French, each battalion choired in its grim trench. Did singing end the First World War? Hardly. And Duffy's wry rhymes here, I think, in this passage seem to know it. As Seamus Heaney put it, no lyric has ever stopped a tank. Generated by the subalterns, the Christmas truce was quickly mixed by the generals who couldn't countenance song fueled outbreaks of human solidarity across enemy lines. There died a myriad, as Pound put it, in the years that followed. But the episode offers a glimpse into one of the many potentialities of, of song as of poetry, though often instrument of state and military power, can also summon carnivalesque and, and connective energies that extend beyond the nation. On the centenary of the Christmas truth, another remarkable depiction of it appeared, this time before a mass audience. The supermarket chain Sainsbury's, in collaboration with the Royal British Legion, made a lavish 30, that, sorry, 30, that would be really lavish, three minute and 40 second Christmas ad that dramatizes the spontaneous truth. Like Duffy's poem in the Imperial War Museum exhibit, the ad recalls British and German troops joining each other in carols on Christmas Eve 
emerging the next morning from the trenches to share greetings, photographs, souvenirs, food, small gifts, and to play football. Um, I think I play at least a bit. Otto. Please meet Otto. Find me. Those, she's gone. And soon, coming. sharing, but also Christmas for buying, right? You don't buy your chocolate bar. So, um, you know, I, let's see, if I can get back to my, uh, please. Is that your first step there? 